So I think Steffi has already made the intro. He's the investment legend. I'm the geek who's good with computers. Um, and I'd like to ask the first question is, who knows what human-assisted artificial intelligence is? <laughs> so, so, so maybe I'll try to define it first before we start talking about it. Uh, when you learn about artificial intelligence, usually in your first lesson in university, uh, you very quickly face a fork. And one direction of the fork is, are you going to try to make machines that look and act and talk like humans? Or are you going to try to make systems that make humans uh, more intelligent or have more abilities? This is a fundamental difference. You have people wasting lifetimes trying to make computer understand jokes, and then you have people that spend lifetimes to make something like Facebook that make people laugh all the time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the human-assisted part is that part, is to try to enhance the abilities of humans uh, with computers. Strangely enough, it's called human-assisted, as if we were helping the computer to be smarter, but it's the opposite. Um, and so Jim and I are going to have a conversation about investment in that space. Um, interestingly enough, you will find that this space is everywhere. Uh, it's a lot more prevalent than um, the more science fiction type of artificial intelligence. Uh, and maybe we can start, I don't know, with Legendary. He has the t-shirt. Uh, Legendary is a movie studio. In honor of Thomas Tull. I'm sorry? In honor of Thomas Tull, our exactly. founder CEO. <laughs> and so, so where did you encounter human artificial intelligence in the field of movies and entertainment? Uh, well, first, thank you. And thank you to Berta. It's great to be back. Thank you to the DLD team. Uh, I've been passionate for far too long, I would say, as we discussed, you know, uh, around what is artificial intelligence and human-assisted intelligence. Uh, I originally studied both computer science and economics as well as Renaissance art at Stanford from 79 to 1983, and I remember several nuclear winters for artificial intelligence, uh, boom-bust cycles, uh, but there's so many fundamental changes now around human-assisted intelligence and machine learning, whether it's film, entertainment, media, art, financial services, healthcare. Uh, for me, if internet investing was exactly the right thing to start and to be very active in in 1995, and perhaps if social media in 2004 and 2005 was exactly the right time to be investing, particularly if there were fortunate investments around entrepreneurs like Mark. As we sit here in 2016, if I offer advice to large companies, small companies, entrepreneurs, investors, the next decade globally will not produce better returns in any field than in human-assisted or artificial intelligence applied to enhance human decision making. Yeah. That would be one person's view. No, I did this true. I don't, I don't know if the reference to the nuclear winter is well understood, but there has been at least two or three boom-bust cycles in artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence has the unfortunate um, property of trying to always say, in 10 years, we will achieve something unbelievable. And Which is what I just said. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then it doesn't happen, and then all the money goes away. Uh, but something has fundamentally changed, as, as we both noticed in the last 10 years, that uh, we do not try to make things that behave like humans. We have actually had enormous success in making humans a lot, uh, uh, a lot more intelligent. Um, Perhaps a few examples would help if you have any of uh, your current investments. For, for sure, and I'll, I'll start with Legendary, uh, which has been a passion, and I think as many people know, I have a passion for Chinese investing as well, and Rebecca, who was on earlier, uh, knows. I've been to China now uh, over 25 times in the last decade and have fabulous partners there. Uh, Chairman Wang of Dalian Wanda, uh, announced a week ago that he would be purchasing Legendary for $3.5 billion U.S. Uh, Thomas Tull will run the company, uh, but Chairman Wong is our new owner. Uh, we're very excited about that. And I'll give a couple examples of how Legendary over the last five years has applied human-assisted learning 
in terms of our day-to-day -day business because I think it's very relevant uh, for a lot of media companies, content companies, whether it's journalism, television, or film. Uh, one of my favorite directors in the world is Chris Nolan. Uh, and when we, as Legendary, uh, helped introduce Interstellar, uh, when we first went live with the preview, we started measuring via Facebook and other social media how was the audience reacting to that trailer and ended up generating enormous useful data. This is not about the cost side. It's about how were different people around the world on Facebook reacting to the legendary trailer. When we put out our second trailer, uh, we incorporated some of the learning from social media from Facebook into what that second trailer would be. And finally, the third trailer, we did the same. We think that in entertainment, media, and information businesses in general, that kind of measurement, which is very much around machine learning, of course, as we discussed, artificial intelligence, but with domain experts looking at the, the data differentiating between signal and noise, if there's one transformative opportunity in the worldwide media and entertainment business, it's around smartly applying machine learning, artificial intelligence to these kinds of applications. And that would be one example uh, I've backed and very excited to back human assisted learning companies in medicine where we have three founders, early employees rather, of Facebook, uh, who have hired a team of data scientists and Genentech individuals. It's called Lyra Health. And they're starting a new healthcare business, again, with an extraordinarily strong team of data analytics, artificial intelligence, to help patients, doctors, and others navigate the healthcare system. Financial services, media, entertainment, and large verticals are being transformed, in my view, and I view it as an extraordinary worldwide opportunity. These are just a few of the examples. Absolutely, and, and I think, Jim, you were the prototype in the 70s because you did study, I guess, business in Harvard, but you did study computer science before in Stanford. Um, and, and we, at Stanford, we have this double major thing, so you can study history and computer science, or art and computer science, or medicine and computer science. And the reason behind that is that everything is better with computer science, and by that we often mean machine learning. <laughs> Meaning that if you have a passion about something, and you know computer science on top, you're going to be a better, a better doctor, a better historian. Et etc. Cetera, et cetera. And a little bit like English, I would say, in, uh, 50 years ago, everything you would do in life would be better if you could also speak English, uh, because it would make you just able to speak with more people. And uh, what do you think about that? You, you, we talked about earlier. We, we did, and I feel uh, if there's a piece of advice I can give some of the large companies I'm on the board of, I'm on the board of 21st Century Fox, uh, smaller companies, entrepreneurial companies, silos absolutely destroy innovation. And whether it's universities, whether it's large companies, small companies, silos destroy transformation. And this idea of dual majors, having a computer science medical combination, a computer science and design combination, computer science and economics, psychology, uh, sits at the heart of what great entrepreneurs, but more, people, more importantly, perhaps, uh, people who can really make a difference going forward, those are the skills that are so important. Uh, I think we're just at the beginning of understanding how fundamental interdisciplinary skills are. And the false dichotomy between science and art, which we talk about all the time here at, at DLD, is still a dichotomy people around the world tend to view as black and white. And that will change and is changing. Well, until people have both skills in them, like so one, right. or, or the teams where, which have both skills. Um, before we take any questions, maybe let's talk about Lira a little bit. So, so basically, this is a startup started by, I guess, the ex-CFO of Facebook. A phenomenal CFO who yeah. left 
year and a half ago, David Ebersman. And basically tackling a very difficult problem of mental health uh, using a lot of technology. So how does that work? Well, it's very exciting, and there's, uh, there's so many lessons that I continue to learn about how to put together these teams. An ideal team would have three or four passionate domain experts and 15 to 20 machine learning, data analysts, artificial intelligence experts. And it's that combination at the beginning in terms of culture that really matters. We all know the silos that exist in medicine, whether it's even within a hospital, departments, the healthcare system in so many ways, in the United States at least, is deeply broken. What Lear is doing is pulling together wonderful healthcare experts around mental health who have great experience, but they're listening and learning from a lot of the data that comes from patients, hospitals, doctors, and they're going to use that to help patients, parents, others navigate the mental health system in the United States. I would expect a year from now, I will have invested in three or four more healthcare-oriented data science companies that are trying to bridge this combination of great passion and expertise with great data analysis and human-assisted intelligence inputs to help patients and doctors make better decisions. Yeah, in a lot of ways, the computer makes it um, easier to start the conversation with data. It seems that often doctors do not talk as much as they should with one another and therefore do not exchange the data. And suddenly you, make a com you put a computer in the equation and things start to flow. If, if it works on both sides well, I think we can revolutionize healthcare. I think because the doctors, typically even the best, the very best, large egos and don't talk to each other, even within the same hospital system or medical school. Uh, at the same time, machine learning, and why I mentioned human-assisted intelligence, is not the be-all and end-all. Machine learning is a great part of the resource combined with the data experts. And in new investing and where I am spending all my time in my travels, whether it's Beijing, Munich, Palo Alto, or Boston, it's this intersection of human-assisted intelligence, machine learning, and great content understanding and depth of knowledge, and trying to put those together in very meaningful ways. I'm sure there would be tons of questions. Oh, well, there was, that was quick. <laughs> it, Hi, my name is Jason Graff. Hi, Jason. <laughs> Uh, very I, re I repeat very the question simply, just in yes. case it wasn't heard. Uh, the question is about, we talked about decisions on either machine making decision, but actually more human making decision based on the data collected by the machines. What kind of decisions are actually uh, made better by the use of machine learning? I'll give two examples. Uh, Circle Internet, which is a blockchain and Bitcoin digital money company in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's the third time I've backed the entrepreneur, is using machine learning, artificial intelligence algorithms to track who should be getting fraud detection, how do we enable seamless, very low-cost transfer of dollars, euros, sterling around the world, and eventually how to better make very low-cost loans to people globally around the world, not just for profit, but in the world of nonprofits as well. In the legendary case, we've used machine learning to not only do some of the things I mentioned around interstellar and trying to market and much more effectively reach our audience, but in, comp in films such as Godzilla, not my favorite, uh, but not bad, uh, we took $55 million out of the marketing budget because of data analytics. So in many of these examples, in media, entertainment, healthcare, financial services, there's an enormous ability to build a better experience.
for the customer. And there's also an opportunity to take massive amounts of dollars around legacy marketing costs that in many cases, it's simply a waste of money. Maybe not. Yes, it is. Like to repeat so I, the question. I repeat it uh, acoustically. So, how does the how does machine learning how can machine learning help the creative process? Basically, knowing that in art and in many human endeavors, creativity is, I guess, more important than the scientific method. Um, but it, yeah, but at least in uh, yeah. So, how does it help, or how do they coexist? Do you have any? Uh, my gosh, I could speak for hours. It's a passion. I'm on two nonprofit boards of museums, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And art is a passion. Uh, but storytelling is as well. And so the obvious examples, not only from the world of art, uh, but in the world of movies, film, content creation, which is why I'm so excited about content creation right now, uh, is simply uh, these tools, perfect example being Pixar, can help if you start with great stories, great content, a great museum experience, uh, using the tools, using the mobile web, using the data to always have that fifth wall for museum goers where some 16-year-old who may not be able to make it to New York for the Metropolitan Museum of Art falls passionately in love with Renaissance art and uses the website to navigate and meets curators online and the curators are meeting the worldwide audience. Those are just a few of the examples of technology that I believe will revolutionize and are revolutionizing, whether it's art, history, the liberal arts, education, that dual application of technology, but great, creative, passionate storytelling, uh, to me, is wondrous and very personally exciting. And, and uh, really, if you visit a movie studio or even a music studio these days, you will find more computers there than in most uh, companies. So, so computers and art have coexisted for quite a while. Uh, there's even classes at Stanford. There's a few classes where you are uh, being judged on your... Um, technical skills as well as the creative output of your technical skills. So if you do video games, for example, so, or visualization, you, have, you actually judge both scientifically and artistically. So there is something there. I think we have just one, what, just one more question. All right. Our microphone showed up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Francisca from Facebook in Dublin. Um, my question is more on the workforce. So The Economist recently published a really long article on how American workforce develops and that there is a really big issue in rural communities where people are just unemployed. They cannot keep up you know, with getting better education. And on top of that, there comes artificial intelligence, which I'm sure takes a lot of work away from people that are already behind. So I would be really interested to understand your opinion here. Well, uh, it's a discussion we've had at Facebook uh, when I first invested in April 2005. It came up within the first couple of months of what technology would do in terms of job creation. And Mark was at, he was 20 years old at the time, so uh, I remember the conversations very well. Uh, I think the fact of the matter is there are so many worldwide great jobs that are created and can be created, whether it's China, Dublin, Munich, Chicago, we could go on and on, where a knowledge and embracement, embracing technology and then coming up with innovative solutions is 
extraordinary in terms of where great jobs and great economics can be created. At the same time, I do get very worried about the large groups we have worldwide that either don't have the technical skills today or are not on a path to have the technical skills. And your team at Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg, Mark, and others, I think are really leading the charge globally to find ways to be inclusive around three to four billion people over the next couple of years in terms of skills, training, wherever they are in the world, how can they better build skills that can make a fundamental difference? I'm very optimistic long term. I know it's a real problem in the short term. I think that's all the time we have. The clock says zero. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Sean.